Chapter Seventeen of the AEF with General Pershing and the American Forces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The AEF with General Pershing and the American Forces by Haywood Brown. Chapter Seventeen. Back from Prison. France has a better right to fight than any nation in the world because she can wage war, even a slow and bitter war, with a gesture. Misery does not blind the French to the dramatic. Even the tears and the heartache are made to count for France. We saw wounded men come back from German prison camps, and Lyon made the coming of these wrecked and shattered soldiers a pageant. Grey men, grim men, silent men stood up and shouted like boys in the bleachers because there was someone there to greet them with the right word. There is always somebody in France who has that word. This time it was a lieutenant colonel of artillery. He was a man big as Jess Willard, and his voice boomed through the station like one of his own huge howitzers as he swung his arm above his head and said to the men from Germany, I want you all to join with me in a great cry. Open your throats as well as your hearts. The cry we want to hear from you is one that you want to give, because for so long a time you have been forbidden to cry, Vive la France! The big man shouted as he said it, but this time the howitzer voice was not heard above the roar of other voices. The French soldiers who came back from Germany had been for some little time in a recuperation camp in Switzerland. A few were lame, many were thin and peaked, and almost all were grey, but the Lyonnais said that this was not nearly so bad as the last train load of men from German prisons. There were no madmen this time. The windows of the cars were crowded with faces as the train came slowly into the station. There was no shouting until the big man made his speech. Some of the returned prisoners waved their hands, but most of them greeted the soldiers and the crowds which waited for them with formal salutes. A file of soldiers was drawn up along the platform, and outside the station was a squad of cavalry trying to stand just as motionless as the infantry. There were horns and trumpets inside the station and out, and they blew a nipping, rollicking tune as the train rolled in. The wounded men, all but a few on stretchers, descended from the cars in military order. Lame men with canes hopped and skipped in order to keep step with their more nimble comrades. There was an old woman in black who darted out from the crowd and wanted to throw her arms around the neck of a young soldier, but he waved to her not to come. You see, she still thought of him as a boy, but that had been three years ago. He was a marching man now, and it would never do to break the formation. Group by group they came from the train with a new blare of the trumpets for each unit. There were 416 French soldiers, 37 French officers, and 17 Belgians. They marched past the receiving group of officers and saluted punctiliously, though it was a little bit hard because their arms were full of flowers. When they had all been gathered in the waiting room of the station, the big colonel made his speech. He did not speak very long because the returned soldiers could see out of the corner of their eyes that just across the room were big tables with scores of expectant and anticipatory bottles of champagne. But there was fizz, too, to the talk of the big colonel. I had the speech translated for me afterwards, but I guess that some of it was about the Germans, for I caught the phrase in human cruelty. You have a right to feel now that you are back on the soil of France after all these years of inhuman cruelty that your work is done, said the colonel, but there is still something that you must do. There is something that you ought to do, you will tell everybody of the wrongs the Germans have inflicted upon you. You will tell exactly what they have done, and you will thus serve France by increasing the hatred between our people and their people. The soldiers and the crowd cheered then almost as loudly as they did later in the great shout of Vive la France. The grey men, the grim men, and the silent men were stirred by what the colonel said, because they did and will forever have a quarrel with the German people. We are doubly glad to welcome you back to France, because our hearts have been so cheered by the coming of America, continued the colonel. Victory seems nearer and nearer, and vengeance for all the things you have endured. It was then that he snatched the great shout of Vive la France from the crowd. As the din died down, the corks began to pop, and men who a little time before had not even been sure of a proper ration of water began to gulp champagne out of tin cups. The sting of the wine, the excitement, and the din were too much for one returned prisoner. He had scarcely lifted his glass to his lips, then he fell over in a heap, and there was one more weary wanderer to make his return sick a bed in a stretcher. But the rest marched better as they came out of the station with band tunes blaring in their ears, 
and god knows what tunes singing in their hearts as they clanked along the cobbles for they had been dead men and they were back in france and there was sun in the sky when they crossed the bridge they broke ranks the old woman in black was there and for just a minute the marching man became a boy again end of chapter seventeen